Tonight, an apology from Calgary's coach for a racial slur hurled in the locker room. The story that opened the floodgates for other players. I'm not surprised. I've been in that hockey culture. We ask, is hockey having a reckoning? Parts of the U.S. paralyzed on the busiest travel day of the year. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was never going to see my family again. How she survived a violent liquor store robbery in Winnipeg. There's a large number of patients who are quite worried. And a critical breast cancer drug in short supply. This is The National. Days after a former player first leveled allegations of racism against the coach of the Calgary Flames, accusing him of using the N-word against him years ago, tonight that coach is breaking his silence and saying sorry. Bill Peters issued an open letter tonight apologizing to his team for using offensive language a decade ago, saying he is taking responsibility but not stepping down. Still. He was not on the Flames bench tonight. And as Aaron Collins shows us, his future and that of the game is still very much up for discussion. Flames coach Bill Peters' absence on the bench tonight speaks volumes about the seriousness of the allegations against him and about the state of hockey. But earlier in the day at Flames practice, the team only wanted to talk about the game. You know, I don't have any comment about that. I'm just here to talk about hockey. It's tough news to hear, but I mean, at the same time, it's... Uh... Right now, we're just thinking about uh, the game against Buffalo. A player Peters coached in the minors is accusing him of using the N-word repeatedly. In a letter to the team's general manager today, Peters acknowledged using offensive language a decade ago. He says he apologized at the time and that, quote, it was not directed at anyone in particular, but that doesn't matter. It was hurtful and demeaning, and I'm truly sorry. But he doesn't acknowledge what another player is alleging. Two incidents of physical abuse confirmed by his former team today. Talking about the incident that, you know, with Bill, uh, for sure happened. The two, two issues that are in question. The Hurricanes didn't fire Peters after those incidents. They gave him a new contract. But at this rink in Calgary, the hope is this time will be different. I think he's done. That's just the way it should be. Yeah, racial slurs and... Yeah, some pretty nasty words were spoken, so yeah, it's unacceptable. Most on this ice agree bad actors have no place in hockey. Still, there's an understanding that racism and abuse are a reality in their sport. I mean, I've played hockey. I know what shit people say. And, I mean, it's not limited to one person. Just because, you know what I mean? Like, how it's do you... It's a culture, really. Yeah, a little bit. And I don't think it has to do with race, either. I think it has to do with, you know, like positions of power. But so. should it stop? Of course. And those who follow hockey say the NHL is changing. Yeah, I think the message from the NHL would probably be that, uh, you know, this is not tolerable in today's world. Uh, you can't act that way. You can't conduct yourself in a, in a racist fashion. How Bill Peters' story will end isn't yet clear. The Calgary Flames say they continue to investigate the allegations and could have an update on the future of their coach tomorrow. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Now, of course, there have been allegations of mistreatment before from different players about different coaches. But right now, it seems people are really li listening, leaning in and reaching out with their own stories. And as CBC Sports' Devin Haru shows us, for one player who was raising alarm a year ago, that is a big change. I'm not surprised. Uh, I've been in that hockey culture. Here they go again. Daniel Carcillo knows what happens behind the closed doors of an NHL locker room and also knows about keeping his mouth shut just to stay in his coach's good books. These coaches can help you achieve your dream. That's why you're seeing all of these stories coming out of junior hockey. They prey on young men's dreams. It forced Carcillo to bottle up his own story of abuse during his junior hockey days until it became too much. Finally breaking his silence a year ago, hands clammy, voice shaking, struggling to find the words. I was yelling like this guy's hyperventilating, you know, we gotta get out of here. In the days that followed, Carcillo faced extreme backlash from the hockey community. He believes people weren't ready to hear about the ugly side of the sport. A year ago, people were literally telling me to go kill myself and that I have brain damage and that I clearly have CTE. 
and that I'm just doing this because I want to get on camera. Wait a minute. But in the last month, something has shifted in the hockey world. Don Cherry fired for these divisive comments. You people love you. you they come here, whatever it is. And after the Leafs fired Mike Babcock, players' stories started pouring out about Babcock's coaching tactics and about Flames coach Bill Peters. Carcillo says his phone is lighting up with messages. From current players, former players, from the NHL, the AHL, all the way down to the minors, all the way down to children. Tainted by abuse so scarring, it's changed his life forever. Stanley Cup glory, Carcillo says, means nothing to him now. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. So, is hockey having a moment of reckoning right now? And if so, is everyone on the same page as to what the root of the problem even is? That conversation in about 25 minutes. Well, there's no remorse today from a retired police officer who admits to posting an inflammatory drawing on Facebook. It depicts white stick figure policemen attacking and pulling a gun on a black man. As Farah Morales shows us, it's such a crude, simple drawing, but one that cuts deep. Good job. Abby Ayula has five children, <laughs> including three boys. Boys she says she immediately thought of when she saw this image. There's a brown boy on the floor and then there's a cop um, that took out his gun, raising the gun at the, at the boy. I was shocked. I was shocked. And I'm scared for them because I don't want their interaction with the cops to be the last interaction they have in life. The image was posted in a private group called Durham Regional Police Friends, open to current and retired members of the force. It was apparently posted by a recently retired officer who didn't respond to our calls and messages. But in a new Facebook post, he takes aim at the person who shared it publicly, saying, quote, Well, at first glance, I did not see anything possibly offensive in it. Some member of the group did. This was handled poorly by the person who did this, and as such, I will not apologize for my error. A source told CBC News the image was posted during the recent trial in Durham region of a Toronto police officer and his brother, accused of beating a young black male so viciously he lost an eye. You know, as far as racism in the force, uh, I w it's not a racist culture. Durham's chief of police condemned the post. We've worked so hard as a police service to reach out to our community and to create a, a sense of inclusion, not only within the service, but in the community. It's, just, it's offensive. It's repulsive. He had this message for the man who shared it. I don't care if you're current or former. Turn in, your, turn in your uniform. Bring it in because I don't want you wearing the same patch I do. This family hopes <laughs> their five children will never see the image. They can't identify with the, with the white people in the, in the picture. They identify with the brown person so that naturally they're going to think that they're bad. Which would only reinforce the fear of police nice and, and a dangerous stereotype. Farah Morelli, CBC News, Toronto. A Winnipeg woman is speaking out about a harrowing attack. She was working at a Manitoba liquor mart last week when thieves went into a violent rampage. And what's more troubling, similar thefts happen all the time. So as Cameron McIntosh tells us, that has employees and customers asking, why can't they be stopped? It's hard to watch, harder still to hear Randy Chase describe it. It's just kind of taken my whole life and derailed it. And I don't feel that... I deserve that. Chase is the Manitoba Liquor Mart employee being attacked in that video. As one robber with a knife pushed security and co-workers, another ran off, bottles in hand. Then Chase was confronted and knocked out cold. And I just was so crippled by fear. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was never going to see my family again. It left her with a concussion. A 15-year-old boy was arrested and is facing several charges, including aggravated assault. Two other suspects are still at large. For months, Manitoba's government-owned liquor stores have been targets of increasingly brazen theft, exploiting a policy prohibiting employees from intervening for their own protection. Good evening, everyone. Last week, the Manitoba Liquor Control Commission hastily announced new secure entrances at all stores, requiring customers to show ID. Chase's store reopened with those doors today. I was afraid that I would get fired or I would be disciplined. 
for protecting myself. Chase first spoke out online and today spoke to media with the support of her union, choosing her words carefully for fear of employer retribution. The Manitoba Liquor Control Commission isn't commenting, but in a release said employees do have a right to defend themselves if attacked. Raises a few more questions in my eyes. You know, how, how, number one, legal well, ramifications, where's the training come from? You know, how far do they go? I don't know emotionally whether I'd be able to go back. Physically, that's in time. As for the liquor stores, it will take months to install all the new entrances, but there's an urgency to it. In Winnipeg alone, police say they're being called out to liquor stores at least 20 times a day. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And now for the outcome of another violent attack we've told you about. And it is a painful result for an Ontario mother. The man who shot and killed her son is walking free. The mall is, uh, you know, she's very upset, obviously. I don't, I don't know how else I can phrase it. The victim, 19-year-old Yosef Al-Haznawi, became known as a good Samaritan because he had come to the defense of an older man being harassed outside a mosque. One of the two instigators shot Al-Haznawi, who died in hospital. Today, a jury found Dale King not guilty of second-degree murder by reason of self-defense. Well, now to an update on a CBC Marketplace investigation into how seniors' homes across the country appeared to be using so-called trespass orders to keep family members out. Well, the Ontario government heard those concerns and now says it's investigating. Here's David Common. I've never once yelled, never once aggressive, never once assertive. After our story about three women restricted from visiting their family by owners of seniors' homes, we heard from dozens of others across Canada stuck in the same situation. Well, it's why it needs to stop, because they're paying the price. We've seen people, um, you know, out of homes for years and not... This elder advocate gets calls about it at least once a week. They've been telling the homes not to do certain things or to treat their parent in a certain way. They're advocating for mom advocating or dad. Advocating for right? mom or dad. Things are going not well. And the home says, that's it. We're just not going to let you come in. The next question, it's become such an issue that it's been raised repeatedly this week in Ontario's legislature. In banning family members for raising concerns about living conditions of seniors is wrong. So my question for this government, will they launch a full investigation into retirement homes using trespassing laws in these ways to make sure that family members can access their loved ones when they want to see them? Much of the debate centers on Mary Sardellas. Her mother's retirement home says she was abusive to staff and told her to stay away. Sardellas says she was only speaking up for her mother Vula's care, previously restricted much of the time to waving at her 97-year-old mom from outside. I think it's unacceptable that Mary had to risk arrest speaker. She defied the trespass order, went into the home and waited for police to come so she could raise her objections to this process. And I want this government to take this concern seriously. I'm not trying to score points. I want you, as a minister, order. to actually do something about this. I'd like to thank the member raising that question. Uh, I'm well aware of this. At the present time, the situation is under investigation, so I cannot answer more in detail. Hi. Sardellis is now back visiting her mother. Many others, though, are not. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. And one more note on another CBC News investigation. Last month, we examined the impact of peer-on-peer -peer violence. And today, Ontario announced new measures to try to prevent bullying in schools. As we all know, bullying is real. It is far too common in our playgrounds, in our schools, and in our communities right across Ontario. The government is creating a five-step plan, including conducting a survey of students and reviewing how schools report instances of bullying. This comes about a month after a 14-year-old in Hamilton was stabbed and killed right outside his school. The province pointed to the teen's death as a reason why it's taking action now. Well, millions of Americans traveling for Thanksgiving weekend may find themselves battling the elements as powerful storms blanket much of the country. One system is unleashing heavy rain and heaps of snow in the west. Another has clobbered the Midwest and is now making its way east towards New York. Susan Ormiston shows us all the problems they're causing. 
It's wintry. That's not news, but this was Southern California last night, and today some 50 million Americans are traveling by road on the eve of Thanksgiving. It just got to the point where, you know, we couldn't keep up, and we ran out of tow trucks, and emergency personnel were stretched about as thin as we could be. Already, Minnesota is digging out after 20 centimeters in one dump. In the last 24 hours, two big winter storms slammed the West and Midwest. A lot of us here stranded and um, can't get to our locations where we can be with our families for Thanksgiving. A so-called bomb cyclone hit the Pacific Northwest, bringing Category 1 hurricane winds, heavy rains and deep snow in the mountains. A 70-car pileup snarled traffic in Washington state. The U.S. National Weather Service has weather alerts in almost every western state tonight. Now, a third potent storm is on its way easterly with a record-setting 2.7 million people booked to fly somewhere. In New York tomorrow, forecasted strong winds over 55 kilometers an hour could ground those giant balloons being readied for an American tradition, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. The weather for Thursday is supposed to be a bit windy. Like last year, we had a similar forecast, and uh, it'll be the same as this, this year. It'll be a game day decision on what we're going to do with the blooms. So, on the menu with turkey and cranberry this U.S. holiday weekend, some wicked weather and delays. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. Yikes. Now, here in Canada, much of southwest Alberta is under snowfall and winter storm warnings tonight. It's pretty cold out, that's for sure. This was the scene in Calgary earlier today. It's been snowing on and off there all day, and there's more expected overnight, up to 25 centimeters in some parts. It's also going to be windy, and officials are warning travel could be difficult. Okay, we're back in just two minutes with more news here on The National, including the sudden death of a Canadian actor and the questions it's raising about the real-life dangers of reality TV. And later, what a critical drug shortage means for thousands of breast cancer patients who rely on it. We'll be right back. Godfrey Gao, a Taiwanese-Canadian actor and model, has died at age 35. And the circumstances, very unusual. He collapsed while taping a celebrity guest appearance on a reality TV show in China. Here's to Shauna Reed on the questions that's raising. A-list celebrities and retired athletes face off in physical challenges on the Chinese reality show, Chase Me. But today, the show faces a different reality after the death of a contestant, Taiwanese-Canadian actor and model Godfrey Gao. Taiwanese news outlets say this video shows the moments before the 35-year-old collapsed while running. Medics on site tried to revive him, but failed. Gao was pronounced dead in hospital. The news shocking for the Asian film community in Canada. Overwhelming shock and um, sadness. Raised in North Vancouver, Gao returned to Taiwan after university where he took up modeling. In 2011, he became the first Asian male model for a Louis Vuitton campaign. Then he moved into television and landed big budget film roles. A lot of uh, Asian actors aspired to him and uh, saw him as a role model. Canadian actor Simu Liu thanked Gao for breaking cultural and racial barriers. Actor Michelle Yeoh shared her own memories but also on social media, concerns about reality TV shows in China not putting safety first. One prominent director said the show must be responsible, and an actress says she left the show citing exhaustion. Winnipeg-based actor Chelsea Mark has been on Chinese reality TV shows. It's up to you. There's no union set in place. There's no, no one protecting you. You have to protect yourself. Mark says, as an actor, he has overlooked his own personal safety while on the job. I'm personally someone who takes challenges very personally. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. I don't, you know, like, you know, let's do it for the show. Wait up, wait up. Wait up. The network that airs the show promises to improve safety. Still, many questions remain about what led to Gao's sudden death. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. 
I want to go to some breaking news right now because we just have word of a plane crash near Kingston, Ontario. Chris O'Neill Yates is standing by for us in our national newsroom in Vancouver. Chris, what can you tell us? Well, Andrew, we know police are confirming that there have been numerous fatalities in a small down plane that happened northwest of the city of Kingston. A, re a search and rescue helicopter from Canadian Forces Base Trenton responded to help in the initial search there. It's said to be a Piper PA-32. That's a high-performance single-engine plane that can carry six people, but we don't know how many people were in the plane when it crashed. Last reports no one in the crash had been transported from the scene. There had been a special weather statement in effect for the area, strong winds out of the southwest gusting to 80. We don't know if that played a role. Kingston police are continuing to provide security at the scene. They're waiting for Transport Canada to arrive to continue this joint investigation. So, Andrew, the plane is down. We know it can carry six people. We don't know how many were on board, so very little information. Information. Kingston police have been providing some updates, but we'll stay on top of it and bring you more details as they become available to us. Okay, time for a quick break. Up next, important health news. Thousands of breast cancer patients rely on a critical drug, but it's in short supply. And later, a number of fiery explosions forced tens of thousands of people from their homes. All that ahead. A crucial medication for thousands of breast cancer patients across Canada is in short supply. Inventories of tamoxifen have been running low since August, but while officials insist they are managing immediate needs, as health reporter Vic Adopia shows us, the situation underscores a growing problem in the drug supply chain. Pharmacists have been counting their supply of tamoxifen closely ever since Canadian pharmacies started running out in August, sending breast cancer patients scrambling. I just picked up the last 10 pills that they had in, uh, at my pharmacy. And, uh, and, and the pharmacist is wonderful where I deal with. Uh, she called numerous pharmacies across PEI to see if they could get any, and they couldn't. Monique Doucette had a double mastectomy and chemotherapy. To avoid recurrence, she's been taking tamoxifen daily for the past seven years. Like thousands of other patients, she's worried about running out. Will this impact me down the road? Will this uh, be the, the you know, thing that causes me to have a reoccurrence? More than half of breast cancers are hormonal. Cancer cells use receptors to feed on estrogen and grow. Tamoxifen blocks the receptors, starving the cancer. It's also used to prevent cancer from returning. There's a large number of patients who are quite worried. This oncologist says tamoxifen can continue to be effective in patients even months after they stop taking it, so they shouldn't worry for now. We would get more worried if that shortage or at least a lack of access would occur over multiple months, two or three months, would be when I would start to get a little bit more worried. Anything measured in weeks is probably within the spectrum of something that we don't believe will have a dramatic impact on cancer outcomes. The biggest supplier of tamoxifen in Canada is Apotex. It blames the shortage on what it calls a change in manufacturing and drug formulation. There's also been an unexpected spike in demand, which has been a drain on the other two makers, Teva and AstraZeneca. There used to be several other manufacturers, then market forces started driving the price down. Consequently, they just stopped making it all together. Then we end up in a vulnerable situation where there's only one or two manufacturers and either they run into a, a problem within the factory itself or they run into a problem obtaining the normal raw materials and there is no replacement. AstraZeneca expects its tamoxifen shortage to be over next week with the other two drug companies following suit in the next month or two. But just like other critical drugs in Canada, shortages have been constant over the past decade. And health policy experts like Dr. Duffin warn it's hard to talk about national pharmacare without a plan to address Canada's drug supply. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Another health story making headlines tonight. Massachusetts is now the first U.S. state to ban the sale of flavored tobacco and flavored nicotine vaping products. Unfortunately, it's becoming increasingly clear that the federal government is not going to act decisively. So we're going to do everything that we can with state-level authority. 
The ban goes into effect immediately and includes menthol cigarettes. Yesterday, New York became the first major U.S. city to pass a similar ban. There have been nearly 3,000 cases of vaping-related illness in the states. 47 people have died. Okay, time for a quick break. Up next, as the NHL grapples with new allegations of abuse and racism, we take a hard look at the future of hockey in this country and whether we are seeing a seismic shift. An in-depth conversation in just two minutes. Well, on the ice, the game looks the same, but on Calgary's bench, proof it is not. Missing is head coach Bill Peters, who's accused by one of his former players of using the N-word in the dressing room. Add in surprising revelations about Mike Babcock's coaching tactics with the Leafs and earlier divisive comments by Don Cherry, all leading to a pretty big question. Is this a moment of reckoning for the NHL? Bruce Arthur is joining us today, sports columnist with the Toronto Star. We also have Donovan Bennett, host and writer with Sportsnet. And we've got Sheldon Kennedy joining us, uh, former NHL player, of course, and co-founder of the anti-bullying organization, Respect Group. Hello to uh, all of you. Donovan, I mean, let's just start by trying to make this real simple. What is happening in hockey right now? Maybe a public intervention? Like, I, I, <laughs> when this story broke, I thought to myself, you know, sunlight is the greatest disinfectant, and this, in a weird way, eventually, might be the best thing for the game. A game which knows it has to tackle these issues. A couple years ago, they came out with their declaration of principles, they being the NHL, knowing that there's a need for them, yeah. for people to understand what they're about, and the, they need to change the conversation. The fact that they have a slogan, hockey is for everyone, that at the beginning of this year, Latage Heritage Month was celebrated for the first time, and last year, Black History Month was celebrated for the first time. They know their game historically has not been inclusive, it hasn't been a safe space, and I think the fact that we're all now having this conversation is going to put them in a position to change all those things. But, but Sheldon, I mean, you know, speaking of sunlight, what, what's at the root of this problem? Because even 10 years ago, I mean, if we're talking about the N-word incident, I mean, 10 years ago, they knew you ought not to say that word, especially in that kind of a context. I mean, what was going on? Well, what I feel is that, uh, you know, when we look at these issues, I mean, we've tried to adjust these issues, workplaces across our country, and, you know, I'm sure down in the U.S. as well, we've tried to address this by uh, by compliance and uh, policies and procedures. And the reality is, is, you know, what we're talking about is a culture shift. This is about a culture change. This is about, um, you know, when we look at the generation of, you know, young athletes or, or individuals that are in our society that are heading into any type of workplace, which I consider hockey a at workplace, there's an expectation there that uh, these issues need to be forefront and center. So I think that, you know, we, we can't just have fancy posters and fancy buttons and policies and procedures and a compliance checkbox uh, if we really want to change culture. This has to get into the priority column. It has to be front and center. We need to be able to educate people on exactly what we're talking about when it comes to the issues of workplace bullying, abuse, harassment, discrimination. Um, and what is it? What's our moral and, and legal responsibility around that and I think you know how do we create a confidence around issues that right now carry a lot of fear so Bruce I mean a flurry of activity the last few days mm -hmm. how deep does this rabbit hole go well, we should start by saying that this isn't all of hockey. We know that. We know that a lot of people across this country have really positive interactions with the game. Um, there's a reason it's so wedded to the Canadian identity, and it's not just money. It's not just that it's an industry. But how deep does it go? Okay, so how many people have played hockey in Canada the last 20 years? How many have a story about hazing? Hmm. Uh, how many of those stories have been told? We've heard stories about hazing in the country. There have been high-profile incidents, and there's been change enacted, but how many have a story about that? How many have a story of racism in the game. Um, you can talk, uh, the people I've talked to in the game, people of color, George Laroque talked about it today, that his parents wouldn't go to games because they'd get in a fight in the stands. Anyone of color in the game of hockey probably has a story, something like that. And then you talk about the Mike Babcock thing. We're talking about different issues, but it all comes down to the same culture. How many have had coaches who think they have too much power and exercise it in ways that really are almost abusive? Um, there's a lot, and the, how far this goes is going to be the common thread of this in hockey is that this is a sport that tells you from a young age what happens in the room stays in the room, that has a fidelity to team, to the game, 
to bigger issues than yourself that suppresses the individual, how many people are going to speak out? That's going to be the real question. How, how serious is what you're talking about? Well, I talked to Dan Carcillo yesterday. Dan in the church of hockey is a bit of a heretic because he speaks about brain injury. He speaks about hazing, his hazing experiences. Um, Akeem Aliou talked about that actually in that piece. And Daniel Carcillo had the exact same hazing experience of naked guys in the, on, in the ba bus bathroom. Um, when you talk to Dan, he's a guy who, who basically says that you can talk about this stuff, but it's hard. The culture in hockey is not built for it. It's not a culture built to listen, um, especially to people who are outside the game. So I don't know. I'm not sure where hockey goes from here because it's not been built to accept these issues. It has tried, as Donovan mentioned. Right. But there's still a long way to go. Uh, Sheldon, uh, so something that Bruce mentioned there before that was, was the power of coaches, right? I mean, that's a big part of this. And, you know, it's tempting to think that, that players ought to have a lot of control over their futures because, you know, they can speak through their talent. But, but tell me the extent to which, which coaches exercise that control. Well, I mean, basically what we're talking about is abuse of power, right? The fear for a job. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, to, to, to talk a little bit further on what Bruce was talking about, you know, about uh, the code or whatever you want to call it. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, that code trickles down from the top. When, when issues that arise or when there's rumblings about issues and they're not addressed or somebody has brought an issue forward and they're not addressed, when they're not addressed, that sets the code. That sets the code that, you know what, you don't talk about anything. And I think that, you know, when we look at, when we look at the issues that are in front of us today and that have been in front of us for a long time and um, you know I think that what a platform here that is sitting in front of the National Hockey League for change and for for to take this on and to be leaders that's going to take some so that's going to take some courage to do but I think you know that's that's what I think is presenting itself in front of hockey today I think that they've done a lot if I look at our case since 1990 my case since 1998 I mean they've ed educated every coach across this country on these issues you know in the minor leagues um and I think that that has, you know, that has helped shift the culture. That's given a little bit of confidence for individuals to come forward. I mean, you would have never heard individuals speak the way they're speaking today, even 10 years ago. So, you know, I think that this is a slow uh, churn, but uh, I, I do believe that um, we have we have came, come you know some distance we've got a long ways to go but I also know that in the with these issues there is no finish line I think as we keep learning we need to keep having these conversations and keep keeping our eyes on the most important piece what is the impact that comes with all of these types of behaviors and they are significant so so Donovan let's talk about the very near term in terms sure. of the ways to go I mean we, we look at the Calgary Flames decision right they've pulled Bill Peters uh, from tonight's game what does that tell you, and what do you think happens from that point on? Listen, we've had incidents like this, unfortunately, before. John Van Beesbrook said similar things to Trevor Daly, who's now in the National Hockey League. He lost his job, but he's working for USA Hockey. So he was hired two years ago. Yeah. So imagine if you're an American player in the United States, and, and you look at that, what does that tell you if you're an African-American wanting to get in the game? It, it, we're talking about the moral part of this issue. We need to look at the business part of this issue, whether it is getting kids into the game that aren't playing it right now, people feeling like they want to watch the game and be a part of it. The National Hockey League and hockey in general needs to open the tent. They understand that. And us having this conversation on the National is not helping them do that. Mm. So, so in your mind, though, is this because to get to that point, I mean, you have to sort through the backlog sure. of problems, right, that we're dealing with. So is this just the beginning? Because you, you think back to the last few days and you think, my gosh, my head is spinning. How many more are there? Yes, and I, I think there are many coaches and, and, and players who are wondering, is my story going to be unearthed? Mm -hmm. and, and the interesting thing is, when it's about winning, we have lots of data about how you relate to young players. And these type of tactics don't work. So forget about the moral aspect. If it's just about having a hockey club that is better, then there's a reason to get all of this out of the game right now. Well, and that's one reason Mike Babcock isn't coaching the Toronto Maple Leafs, because he didn't relate to young players to the same degree as others. Right. But when you talk about how hockey is going to change, and in terms of like winning and coaches, we excuse a lot in the name of winning, and especially when it comes to hockey, and especially when it comes to this country. 
Um, the stories that are going to come out, like how did Me Too start? Me Too started with one newspaper story and it's still not stopped. I wonder if this is going to be the same thing. And I'm not suggesting it's exactly analogous, but what I'm saying is that there are a lot of people who have had bad experiences with hockey who didn't think anyone was going to listen to them because the sport wasn't built to that. So once this starts happening, once you start talking about all the different issues we've talked about here tonight, I think the floodgates could open. And it's at that point that you go, what's the best way to grow a game, not only at the highest levels in the NHL, but in terms of our kids playing? How inclusive do you want to be? How safe a space does it have to be? And Sheldon's talked to, he's, he's trained people all, all across sports. Hockey needs this. Offices need this. You want to be able to invite people into the tent. Hockey's been very good at preaching to its own church. It needs to get outside that. And just to follow up on that point, I reached out to some African-American current players and former players, just asking, were you surprised? And all of them said in the locker room, not at all yeah. surprised. And that should tell you something. And one thing I heard from a former player that struck me, he said that it's much worse in Canada than it is in the United States. So we as a country, if we want to say we are diverse and we are inclusive, and hockey is our sport, mm -hmm. and hockey historically has not been diverse or inclusive, those things right now are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They need to be if we want to be as proud of the game as we are. Donovan, Bruce, Sheldon. We gotta leave it there. Uh, fascinating points, fascinating questions being raised. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And we are back in two minutes with a look at news from around the world, plus. And I get people, you know, saying, you look younger all the time. I don't wanna go back where I was. Now get this, she's 73, more fit than ever. Her remarkable transformation into an Instagram star is tonight's moment. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, why the Trudeau government is fighting a tribunal's order to compensate First Nations kids affected by the on-reserve child welfare system. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Two enormous explosions at a Texas chemical plant forced tens of thousands of people to flee today. So look at that, the video's pretty wild. It shows the moment a massive fireball filled the sky. This is about an hour and a half drive east of Houston. Only three people have been reported injured so far, but there's heavy damage throughout nearby communities. Windows and glass just come flying into the bedroom, scared us to death and just grabbed clothes and things because I, I knew we couldn't stay here because I didn't know what else might blow up over there if one thing exploded. A mandatory evacuation has been issued for anyone within six kilometers of the plant as firefighters continue to fight that toxic blaze tonight. The plant makes chemical and petroleum-based products. Rescue efforts continue in Albania following a deadly earthquake that struck early Tuesday morning, the worst in decades. Now today, rescuers managed to save a man trapped in the rubble from the magnitude 6.4 quake. And new video shows a young boy dug out yesterday by hand from a collapsed building near the quake's epicenter. Thousands of survivors have been left homeless and are now taking shelter in tents set up by the army. At least 30 people died in the quake, but that number is expected to rise. And Donald Trump says he would like to legally designate Mexican drug gangs as terrorist groups. The comments by the U.S. president come just three weeks after nine U.S. citizens were gunned down in northern Mexico. Trump said American forces were willing to, quote, go in and clear out drug cartels. Mexico's president, however, has rejected the idea, saying that cooperation is necessary, but no U.S. intervention. Okay, we have to take a two-minute break, but when we come back, California is sinking. What's going on below ground and the impact it could have on what you eat? California grows $50 billion worth of food every year, much of it coming to Canada. But all that farming has a pretty radical impact on the earth itself, and in a way you would not expect. Kim Brunhuber shows us why a large part of the state is sinking. Mm. It's very good. 
When you walk through Jeannie Williams' sunny orchard, you don't notice anything wrong, but the problem's there, underfoot. The land around her, about 250 square kilometers, is sinking. We get everything from the well, and I know that the water is clean. We don't have problems with E. coli and things like that because um, you know, it comes straight from the ground. Her well is small and shallow, but this is California's Central Valley, which produces about a quarter of America's food supply and a large part of the $3.5 billion worth of produce that California exports to Canada. For more than a century, farmers have been pumping water out of the ground, so much so the land around here is slowly sinking, a process known as subsidence. In less than 100 years, it's dropped eight and a half meters. That's frightening because it may not come back. You know, if we do get a good water year, you know, the, is the land going to come back up? Corcoran, the self-proclaimed farming capital of California. No coincidence, it's also the state's subsidence capital. For years, NASA has used satellites to measure how far the ground is sinking. The darker the color, the more the land has sunk. That dark purple area centered around Corcoran, all farm country. Some areas actually are sinking one to two feet a year. So, I mean, that's a, a huge amount. And the region's already feeling the effects. Groundwater hydrologist Michelle Sneed says this was a wet year and still the ground sank more than two and a half centimeters. That's still quite a bit. It, it, is, um, it is quite a bit when you're talking about, um, you know, the, the impact uh, to canals. Like this one, the Friant Kern Canal. It's a 250 kilometer long aqueduct that delivers water to 15,000 farms, but the system depends on gravity and the ground has sunk so much in some spots, the water now has to travel uphill, basically turning the canal into a deep pool. It can only transmit about 40% of the water that it was designed to transmit. Subsidence doesn't just affect infrastructure like bridges, roads, and canals. It also reduces the ability of the earth itself to store water. And once that capacity is lost, experts say, you can't get it back. But the problems don't end there. In the tiny community of Allensworth, no one dares drink from the tap. Israel Sanchez spends about $200 a month on bottled water. This is what the, we had to go buying all the time mm. in the town. And the, so the water that basically goes to your house here, yes. you, you can't drink that? No, no. That's because the water's dangerously polluted with arsenic. Subsidence is kind of like squeezing a sponge. The sinking ground presses contaminants like arsenic out of the soil and into the groundwater. 10% of wells tested in this agricultural hotspot have shown dangerous levels of arsenic. And just across from Sanchez's house, a cautionary tale. Historic Allensworth. In the early 1900s, a thriving African-American community. By the 1960s, an empty tourist attraction. One of the reasons this town was eventually abandoned, arsenic. More humans using the water, water not being replenished, and it, the concentrations are gonna get higher. They did deem the wells in the 60s as poisonous and undrinkable. With the added threat of drought due to climate change, experts say more needs to be done to curb water use right now, or the ground will keep sinking and the aquifers will keep shrinking. The farmers now are coming to terms with that and that they may have to pump less. There we go. But many farmers say that's not likely unless the state of California builds more reservoirs. Until then... Farmers have no choice but to pump it out of the ground. That or we don't grow crops. And people need to eat. You don't have to go far to look for proof. Just next door, her neighbor is digging a new well for his farm. It's big and it's deep. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, near Corcoran, California. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, this woman is 73 years old and she's a fitness Instagram star. We'll tell you all about her in our moment. This woman started working out at 70 years old. She's been featured on magazine covers and has become a bit of an Instagram star. It all started three years ago. She was unhappy, overweight, and on a lot of medication. So she started training with her daughter, who herself is a bodybuilder, and, well, neither of them has looked back since. So this journey to fitness and fame is our moment. There's no age limit, really, to what you can do. Mom is demonstrating the deadlift beautiful. You put up your own barriers. It's a mental thing. 
I was just very negative place, a very negative place. Now I can look in the mirror and I'm happy. Strong up. Oh. On my Instagram, a lot of people will say that I'm such a role model for all ages. I don't want to be what I was because that was, I was slowly dying. Now I'm gonna live. A role model for all ages. Uh, I'd, I'd never heard of Joan McDonald before. I'm just looking at her Instagram page right now. She looks incredible. <laughs> she, like, she looks really, really good. Uh, and her story is even more wonderful than that. That's The National for this November 27th. Have a good night.